Welcome back. We're starting a new unit today, our last unit for this year. Um, this one's going to be on personal selling and sales promotion. So we're going to look at a lot of things like face-to-face -face selling, some of the techniques, um, and particularly in this video lecture, we're going to look about how uh, companies manage their sales forces, which means how do they uh, make decisions about how to incentivize them, use their time, um, different types of personal selling versus like uh, person versus what also would include personal selling, but like over the telephone. Um, and some of the issues related to more or less organizing the sales force. So let's begin with our roadmap as we do every time. Uh, we're going to look at three things today. The first one is what are the different ways to manage and organize a sales force? Uh, you can do it geographically. You can do it functionally. Um, sometimes people outsource their sales into a separate company from their, from their manufacturing. Um, and so there's a few different ways to do that. And we're going to talk about some of the pros and cons of, of, of that, of those choices. Um, or secondly, we're going to look at what activities beyond the actual selling uh, do sell people um, engage in and why they do that. So there's a lot of administration, paperwork, uh, they have to find leads, they have to do research, and all those things um, really cut into their actual like face-to-face -face sales time. And lastly, um, how salespersons are incentivized and compensated. Um, salespeople usually are paid through commissions, uh, which is very different than most either wage or salary uh, employees. Uh, usually they have maybe some relatively small base salary that they get regardless, but most of their income is based on the uh, volume of their sales. So it might be several percentage points of their total sales, um, different for each uh, sales company. But the idea is that when they generate more business, they are paid more. Um, and when they don't generate business, uh, they're, they're, they're paid less. And as a result, um, it kind of ameliorates maybe some of the risk about in hiring a lot of people to, to act as salespeople. Um, and incentivizes them to use their time wisely and to uh, prioritize, um, you know, the volume of sales for your company. So let's start uh, taking a look at that by uh, talking about what personal selling is. Um, it is personal, and usually this means face to face, but it doesn't necessarily mean uh, you actually have to face someone. It can be something over a phone. Um, but the key thing here is that it's a person to person uh, sales pitch. And so the idea is that you are uh, building a, a more of a relationship, that it's likely to be more interactive. Um, it's per, uh, differentiated from like, say, broadcasting and advertising, where really the, the communication of information is one way. Um, and anything that kind of fosters a personal and kind of interactive relationship with their customer might fall under the, uh, the umbrella of personal sales. Uh, so most salespeople um, are relatively well-educated, meaning college-educated, trained professionals. Uh, most people see salespeople as a white collar profession. Um, and I think probably more than a lot of people, these are people who are social butterflies, people who are comfortable uh, maintaining social relationship, people who are articulate in expressing themselves, um, and people who um, are able to maintain um, ongoing and long term uh, relationships with their customers. Um, and so, gen I mean, the difference is that you, know, you might think of someone on the floor of a retail store as a salesperson as well. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about people who are offer takers and um, offer makers, which means that if you're working a register or you're working on the floor and you're not really actively involved in selling, which means the customers do all the work and all you're doing is completing the sale, um, this is not really what we consider personal selling. Um, however, you do have places where um, really in high-end uh, department and luxury stores um, where the sales, uh, auto, uh, um, auto traders, um, car salesmen, et cetera, where they're getting a commission, even though they're working, let's say, in a relatively small area, um, a sales floor. Um, so what is a salesperson? Just let's uh, add a definition here just to add some more clarity, um, particularly uh, differentiating a salesperson from a broker or an agent. Um, it's something that represents the, custom, uh, the company to customers. Um, and the, they're not just, in a sense, involved in, in selling. They might be involved in prospecting leads, which means gathering information about people who might be interested in the company's product. Uh, people who are involved in communication, which means people who are handling um, uh, back and forth communications with customers or uh, clients, um, people who are actually involved in closing the sales, people who are providing uh, information gathering or providing uh, customer service, um, and anything that might be considered relationship building with the customers would be fall under, let's say, the umbrella of a salesperson. So, as I said before, um, salesperson covers a wide range of positions like not every there are very different types of salesmen and there are different functions um, and different organizations of different salespeople. Um, so as I was saying before order takers are people who are basically not really in a sense 
getting people to make an order. Um, the customer does the shopping themselves. They make decisions about what to buy. And really what they're doing is just clerking, uh, working the register and saying, look, uh, um, and, and completing the purchase. Um, but they're not really in a sense, in a sense, trying to encourage or push a particular product upon their uh, customers. Um, an order getter would be more someone who someone goes door to door or someone who makes cold calls via the telephone. Um, and this usually demands more creative um, ways to get people to talk to you because in the sense that you, the, uh, the, the customer didn't initiate the interaction, you have to go out and initiate the interaction with either a reluctant or someone who didn't even really understand that they had a need for the product um, and talk to someone who they're not familiar with. And so uh, this requires a different set of social skills uh, beyond just providing service and representing and wearing a suit, um, but sometimes creative ways to uh, um, build a relationship. So, you know, I think the most common way to, you know, identify an order getter um, is someone who carries a lot of business cards. And you see this in terms of people carry business cards because they are networking all the time. They're passing out their cards so people know who they are. Um, even to people who they're not really thinking are going to be immediately in the market for their products. Um, another way you often see this is where um, in diners and other delis and places where you'll see people like a cork board where people will take their business card and pin it to the wall. And while people are doing other types of businesses, um, it's a way of, let's say, putting your name out there. Uh, real estate agents uh, do a lot of this as well. Um, and, you know, in the sense of like selling themselves and having a lot of the personal face to face interactions as a major part of their job. So personal selling. Um, it can be done in a variety of ways, as I've mentioned. Uh, it can be face-to-face, -face, it can be over the telephone, it could be, as we are in our epidemic uh, world, uh, through Zoom or over video web conferencing. Um, and it can be done in other ways. So like uh, one thing I'm seeing more and more is people initiating uh, text conversations. I'm seeing this mostly in terms of uh, political campaigns where people get your phone, where you've given your phone number or you've given um, uh, email address to a campaign and then they send a text message and they basically say, uh, how are you doing? I'm here with such and such campaign or company. Do you have time to talk right now? And I've even seen this now with um, some retailers who are contacting people, uh, following up on purchases of people who are uh, high volume or return buyers. Um, it is often more effective in, in than advertising uh, for complex uh, products or situations. So things that are more tailored to individual customers things that have to be customized, um, uh, things that are high uh, um, costly investments. So for example, a lot of medical equipment is done through personal selling um, because you know a machine can cost tens of thousands of dollars, if not more. Um, and they, in some ways, it's not something, it's something that might have to be installed. It might have to be in a sense tailored to a particular office space or physical space. Um, and you know, uh, very often you see this, uh, like uh, what might be in a similar situation is buying an automobile because it's a major capital purchase. And so people want the reassurance or they want to be able to talk out their decision because uh, as we talked about the different types of buyers and we talked about consumer behavior in the past. Um, this is a shopping type of product. It's a product where people have to kind of think in their mind, they're making comparisons. And so it's helps to have someone there who you're kind of having an out loud conversation with when you're talking about your concerns and questions, and they might be able to tailor, uh, find the product that matches your needs. So if you are describing what you need in terms of a vehicle, uh, it might be easier for, um, um, for the salesperson to put you into the right car that matches your needs rather than the one that's, you know, looking at all the cars on a car lot. Uh, same thing with a real estate agent. Um, so one good example of this would be high-tech aircraft, uh, I mean, commercial aircraft, so Boeing, uh, which sells, you know, obviously very expensive uh, uh, products to a variety of different airlines. So there's limited buyers and also, uh, uh, you know, really only one or two major sellers in the world. They have to manage relationships with a lot of different countries. Um, they have, to, obviously, it requires a lot of spare parts, a lot of maintenance, things of that sort. Um, and so you're going to see salespeople being a much larger part of, let's say, um, how they sell. So Boeing is not likely to run advertisements on TV broadcasts. Boeing is not unlikely to do things like incentive programs or promotions like, you know, buy one 747, get a 727 50% off. Uh, but they are likely to have a lot of personal selling um, uh, because these are long and complex contracts and they're also very costly uh, purchases. 
Um, so in a lot of these um, corp large corporations, particularly uh, large manufacturers, things like GE, IBM, um, Boeing, um, you're going to have what you might call a real sales force, which means it's not one or two salespeople, but like uh, it's going to be a major division of your of your corporate structure. Um, and it's basically the link between you and your customers. Um, they're not going to talk to the president. They're not going to talk to someone on the assembly line. Uh, they're going to talk to the salespeople and they're going to represent the firm to the customers, but they're also going to re represent the customers to the firm. So they're kind of, let's say, um, saying, look, this is what my customers are telling me they need. And this might be information to manufacturers or designers uh, to modify or change their product. And so they're really not just in a sense of one way communication. They're a two way communication, um, even though they're employed and paid by uh, one party in that communication, um, because they're looking for long term relationships. And those are based upon customers being satisfied. Um, and that means even addressing some of the irrational demands or needs of the customers, um, as well as, uh, you know, making profitable sales uh, for, for the company that employs them. Um, so sales is one part of the larger, you know, marketing, um, but they should work with the other types of, we talked about the integrated promotion mix is that they should be part of other, you know, bringing together the other things going on so that in the way that the representations they make as a per, in, in personal sales should match what's, what's going on in terms of advertisements or public relations. Um, and so that, you know, you kind of have a unified, consistent message being brought to your customers. So part of this is like, how do you manage your sales force? And a lot of this is because they're going to be so close to your customers and they're not going to be um, necessarily operating in a place where you can observe their activities because they're going to be making a lot of personal calls. They'll probably be doing a lot of travel. Um, there's how do you actually manage and supervise and oversee uh, your sales force to get them to be as productive as possible when you're not going to be able to observe their behavior um, every second of every day. Um, and so when we talk about sales force management, we're talking about um, not just in a sense hiring these people and, and paying them a commission that's preset but kind of incentivizing them and directing them and, you know, planning for how they're, go they're going to spend their time um, uh, managing relationships. So the first one is just the Salesforce structure, which means that um, you can, you're going to specialize or have a division of labor among your Salesforce. And there's different ways to do this. So you can have territorial sales, um, which means that each salesperson um, is, in charge of a certain geographical territory. You see this a lot with um, beverage companies such as Pe um, Pepsi Bottling Group or Coca-Cola, where um, they have a, an area and they'll be traveling store to store and they have geographic territory in part so that they're not competing with each other. Um, and so there's no um, miss or cross communication between salespeople from the same company. Um, and uh, it can also be because in some t territories might be more profitable than others. Uh, you might decide to send your best salespeople to particular markets um, as opposed to others because of their 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 abilities being better. They might be able to generate be uh, better sale better sales or better relationships, particularly if there is a bad, uh, something that has to be corrected in an area. And you might give, let's say, a new salesperson a relatively easy uh, territory to basically learn the ropes, um, but in a way where they're not going to be jeopardizing your overall um, uh, revenues. Um, so territorial sales, I think, work when there's going to be a lot of face to face time because of the limits of travel and you can kind of plan it that, you know, you kind of go in a circuit and you kind of do a rotation among your um, your customers and maybe assign a day or two to developing new leads and new customers in your territory. Um, another very common way to do sales is to be specialized by product, which means that salespeople will become experts in a particular product and they know it so well that they're able to uh, describe and communicate and uh, answer customers' questions about how the product works or how the product functions. Um, you kind of see this on the floor of, let's say, uh, large big box um, hardware stores like Lowe's and uh, Home Depot, which is that they tend to have um, people are relatively specialized in the different departments of their store. So in the plumbing section, you probably have someone who's a retired plumber. In the hardware section, um, in tools, someone in carpentry, et cetera, uh, someone who's an electrician in lighting. And they're not just in a sense saying, well, I know where this is, it's on that shelf, but they're able to kind of match uh, whatever the product is to the job that you're describing and maybe give advice about an easier way or a better way to do that. Um, 
you can specialize salespeople by customers so that customers, uh, certain customers might be more demanding. Some people might have better relationships or better ways of communicating with certain personality types. Uh, you might, uh, I think you see this particularly in real estate sales where some real estate agents specialize in really high end houses and really, let's say particular people, i.e. that they only traffic in million dollar properties while other people might uh, be uh, work better with apartments or uh, only work in a local area. So they're specializing by the type of customer there are. And then you have complex sales structures that might be a combination of the three types mentioned. So medical suppliers, as I mentioned, um, is you have a relatively limited number of buyers, like most people are not going to be buying medical supplies. Uh, you have doctor's offices, you have clinics, you have uh, hospitals, but you're not just going to run into a doctor walking down the street or you're not going to do a home visit. Um, and because every uh, medical practice is slightly different, um, what they're going to need in terms of medical supplies is going to be very tailored. And also you're dealing with a very highly educated workforce um, in the sense of uh, doctors and nurses who, who are experts in what they need. And you're not going to be able to push shoddy merchandise on them in the same way because they're going to have some specialized knowledge about um, what are the demands and what are the parameters of the supplies they need. So you're going to have someone who maybe has a background in the field, uh, maybe someone who um, knows particular clients very well, and a lot of personal uh, service from place to place. The next kind of decision is not just the structure, but looking at the size of the sales force. So you can range from having you know, a handful of salespeople to sales forces of, in the, and the thousands of tens of thousands. And partly this is based on the size of the, of the company um, and based on the size of the accounts and whether you're looking for new leads or whether you're just managing current account, uh, sale, uh, sales accounts. Um, so when the larger your sales force, obviously, the more personnel, the more the cost. Um, but also, most likely, the larger the sales force, the more sales you're likely to make. Now, some of these things about uh, sales are going to be determined outside of the size of your sales force by the ups and downs in the economy, the uh, health, uh, the economic health of a region. Um, but obviously, if there's more people out there, they're probably going to be able to make more sales than they would be otherwise. Um, so. Uh, you know, looking at balancing the workload that you give to individual salesperson might be an important consideration, especially when you have a large sales force. Um, so you can group accounts and create, instead of independent salespersons, you can have teams of them that either focus on a certain geographical region or a certain product um, and allows them to coordinate their efforts and also to bring new eyes to uh, problems or uh, having different people for different uh, customers um, if, in the sense that you can vary, let's say, the personality, you can uh, vary the gender of the salesperson, things like that, that might work better in particular situations. Um, and I think a lot of this is also about the load approach is that um, how many people are needed to service a certain number of accounts? So if you are in a, uh, in a, in a business where there is a lot of um, uh, service and follow up required, it might, you not, might not be able to manage the same number of accounts where it's mostly about making a sales and a purchase, or there's kind of, let's say, repeat customers that are not particularly complicated. And so you, you might, in a sense, balance the workload depending on, as I was saying, like, is it a new territory or is it uh, uh, a well-established uh, uh, territory that the salesperson is, is managing? Um, some other Salesforce strategies um, can make decisions about, let's say, whether you have an outside Salesforce. So, the difference between an outside sales source, one that travels to customers and is mostly on the road, uh, traveling uh, from customer to customer, and therefore, in a sense, a lot less supervision, versus an inside sales force like um, a call center or um, people who um, come to an office and they, from their offices, they call their clients and they ask them about their needs and things of that sort. Um, you can make things where there's team selling, which is that you are combining people with a variety of different backgrounds and talents um, so that you have a group of people who are able to answer all the different possible concerns that a customer might have. So you might have someone who is involved in installation. You might have someone who's involved in marketing. You might have someone who understand uh, the financing available. Um, so for example, um, one, of, one of my brothers is involved in uh, the financial sector and is a salesperson for uh, a major bank and in his office he has some people that 
handle accounts. So he has people who are specialized in different types of securities. Um, he has people who do the administrative functions. Uh, and, and because, you know, while he's, let's say, in charge of the team, um, he doesn't know everything in a specialized way about all the things that might be involved. And having people th are there, especially, for example, when you have diversified types of investments, you might want to have a customer talk to someone that has more specialized knowledge than you have. And I think having, even if you, even if you don't know something, I think it's impressive when you're able to make a quick referral to someone who can understand and explain something better than you. It shows kind of a level of preparation or a, le a level of service um, going forward and, and it might lead to, let's say, a development and building of trust. Uh, so even though personal selling is mostly, we think of it in terms of face-to-face -face and door-to-door -door or business-to-business -business selling, um, what you're seeing is that um, for a variety of different sales that uh, working over the phone um, and working uh, uh, working over the internet can be just as effective as you know in-person uh, uh, sales um, approaches uh, because sometimes people do not want people coming to their business because you can be interrupting their workflow uh, they might have a, a different situation they can't don't have time to sit down um, but they might be able to take a phone call or return a phone call um, in an asynchronous way because of the nature of their production process or the nature of their business. So this is a reflection. Um, Insight Salesforce has obviously used phone or internet to make service and contact. What are some of the products and services that might you know, favor an inside Salesforce more than an outside Salesforce? So I mentioned that, for example, um, a lot of medical sales is outside sales uh, because there's a lot of tailoring and customization that only could be gathered by actually seeing the layout of a particular clinic or hospital or doctor's office um, and that might favor um, uh, um, outside sales. I think inside sales would be would favor something where there's a standardization of the product, um, things where you have customer service, things that uh, there might be long distance or long-term logistics involved um, which cannot be done, let's say, on the road that require, you know, presence in the office or the ability to contact um, uh, other people. Like, for example, if you need to con consult your engineer or installation specialist or logistics, uh, you want to be able to have most of your team that can have face-to-face -face communications uh, rather than have isolated salespeople who might not have that, the reference to those, um, uh, those, uh, um, uh, to those resources um, in the company. Another good example of something that might be favoring outside sales, um, just because I ran into this, is um, uh, solar panels. And I find that most uh, solar salespeople um, are kind of free agents. They own work for a particular company. They do solar contracts. And I've discovered that they can work for several different solar companies. Um, and so what often happens is you call the company and they send out a personal, they send out, they give the contract to the first person, uh, you know, kind of in, you know, grab a ticket, this is your client. Um, and the reason why outside sales works is because I think they need to see, uh, first of all, it's a major purchase. It's, it's expensive and therefore people need to be reassured about some of the basic, the costs. Um, but also because every roof is a little bit different, uh, you don't have a standardization in the product as you might have uh, for something like, um, I might be a more example, like a home appliance, like a refrigerator or washer, dryer, dishwasher, uh, where more or less most kitchens or uh, laundry rooms are set up to handle standard like sizes um, and so you don't need someone coming to your home to go say well this washer dryer works for your home and not for someone else's so um team selling so one thing about team selling is that you have more heads uh addressing the problem you have different perspectives um sometimes you have different styles and so depending on your customer a different style of salesperson uh, might work better and having a variety of different people means that you have a different way to approach someone and you might let's say uh, someone who's not going to be responsive to a hard sell you might have someone who's better at the, kind of the soft sell uh, speaking to my own experience with solar panels um, I had one salesperson who was very aggressive and very much like uh, wanted to uh, buy the most panels possible and was kind of very very pushy wanted a commitment that particular day um, and I had another one who was kind of laid back and kind of like more listening to what I was saying, saying I don't want to have my entire roof covered in solar panels. I'm not looking to rent solar panels um, and, you know, was very laid back, didn't not a lot of follow up, but was more um, convincing to me because I didn't feel like it was pushy. 
Uh, and for myself as a customer and my wife, that seemed to be like a better approach because we weren't uh, ready to make a particular uh, purchase at that moment. But what they did is they listened to like what, what our concerns were and what, how we were trying to do it. And um, right up to the day of installation, they were very good about making customizations and making alterations and modifications um, uh, in response to some of our concerns. Now, the pitfalls of team selling is that salespeople are competitive, um, especially when you have a commission type of incentive system. Um, a salesperson might not want to give a sale to uh, one of one of their um, one of their uh, coworkers. Um, and so, what you might see is that they might be undermining each other in the sense that uh, they might tell the customer that the other salesperson is not very good or not knowledgeable, um, and they should go with them. And so, you get cannibalization and working across purposes. Um, sometimes customers, what happens is they get calls from a variety of different people um, and they want to have one particular name. So there's one go-to person uh, handling it. And if they talk to different people and, and people have different understandings or different information, um, this can overwhelm and confuse the customer. Um, some people are just not team players. Uh, some people don't really like being lone wolves because they like to kind of set their own hours. They like to set their own patterns. Um, I know for my my brother working in financial sales, um, there were certain like group events such as like informational dinners, you know, kind of as a financial seminar. Um, and he didn't like to use that because he felt like that's not where um, I do best, you know, because I don't control the situation. Um, but what he did like is being able to kind of hang out and have conversations. And by hanging out and having conversations, meaning that um, uh, working one-on-one -on -one rather than working at table of potential clients uh, fit it. If he was kind of forced to work someone else's kind of pattern or someone else's approach, he might not be as effective in what he did best as a salesperson. Um, and lastly, uh, it's hard to say when you make a sale as a team, you know, who really should get the credit. Um, and particularly in a world where there's commissions and bonuses, and these are allocated based upon contribution to the final sales, it might not be clear who on the team was most responsible. So a key aspect of salespeople is uh, recruitment, which means you need to be able to, they represent your company. Uh, they're gonna be relatively independent, which means you're not gonna be looking over their shoulder all the time. And so a lot of their success depends on, you know, selecting the right quality of people who are going to be um, two, two aspects. So first of all, that they're gonna be able to do what you want them to do when they're not being directly supervised. But secondly, you want people who are there for the long term because you want them to know your product well and you want them to build long term relationships and you don't want to have a different person on your sales force, you know, every three or four months. And, you know, your customers having to relearn uh, and reacclimate to a new salesperson. And so you want to be able to pick a person that's going to be compatible with your corporate culture, but also someone that you can trust um, um, handling and representing your business. So. These have to be people who are intrinsically motivated because they're people who um, are not going to be supervised and therefore you're not going to be on top of them and providing the structure. Uh, these are people who have to manage their own schedules and time. So you want someone who's disciplined and perhaps more organized. Um, and you need people who are able to close the sale, which means they don't just talk to people and, you know, their time, they actually get to a closing of the deal. Um, in the famous uh, play and movie, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, they basically say the kind of the mentality of a salesperson is ABC, meaning always be closing. Um, you're always trying to close the sale and get the business done so you can move on to the next potential customer or client. Um, and someone who is a people person and can build relationships because a lot of it is about building trust. So where can you uh, recruit your sales force? So very often uh, it happens on recommendations. It's, it's a community. People know people who work for different companies or competitors. Uh, so what I thing I found about solar panels is that um, it's the same 10 or 15 salespeople who work for different companies and they jump from company to the company because the product is basically the same. The sales pitch is basically the same. Solar companies are not really that differentiated. Um, and basically they go because of the differences in commission structures or incentives. And they have um, a reputation because if they've worked in the air, uh, they worked in the field for a while. Um, you know whether they're able to actually move their move the product. Uh, obviously, employment agencies and classified ads. Um, 
because a salesperson doesn't require a degree, you just you're really looking for someone who is able to communicate. And I think recruiting salespeople is one area where interviews are actually one of the best tests of how they're able to do their job. Because if they're able to sell themselves to a person they haven't met before, the person hiring them, they're probably going to be pretty good at selling a product to someone they haven't met before, a new customer or client. The other thing is there's often training involved in sales. And so some sales um, products, you know, they, they give the salesperson more leeway about how they want to represent the product. Um, you also sometimes have like a script and um, you basically get a binder and, you know, you start, they want you to read the same thing every single time to every single client because they, you have someone who wants to really have control over your message. Um, this is particularly true on telephone sales. Um, where they call you up and they read down a script and very often that they have kind of tabs there based upon different um, customer responses um, and because so there's and as a result there's a lot of training um, training can be expensive especially if it's in-person training um, but it can lead dramatic results because you're better able to evaluate how you're selling things because you're doing something that's more standardized um, but the other thing about the training is that the customers are getting a consistent message um, and not one that's garbled uh, through the, you know, through the translation or interpretation of individual salespeople. Um, it also can, communicates that you really actually know your product, that you're getting the same answer. Um, I find that one thing that's very concerning for me is when I talk to three different people from the same company and I get different answers on key questions. And that tells me that there's not, they're not really clear and they're just making something up on the spot. Uh, to satisfy you know the fact that they got asked a question um, so what you've seen is more online training that can be more standardized and webinar training uh, to get people to be more consistent in their approach so what you see here is one example of um, you know a game called rep race where it's a video game to that Bayer um, Bayer pharmaceuticals uses to train their sales individuals um, and it leads to a lot of while every doctor is somewhat unique in their personality, very often they have the same needs and they have, um, it's a way of testing perhaps like your knowledge of the product, as well as making sure that the representations made by your company are the same for all the sales associates. Um, one key thing about uh, Salesforce is that, as I said before, their method of compensation incentive is quite different than most uh, employees. Like most people either work by a wage, which means they get paid an hourly rate, or they receive a salary, which means they get the same pay um, regardless of the number of hours they have, but they're on, you could say, on, on call all the time. Um, so generally what happens with salespersons is that when you're learning in the first year or two years, um, you basically receive a salary or a fixed income um, because they realize that you're learning the product, you're learning the area, um, and you're not going to be able to make as many sales because you're still kind of in a training mode. Um, and so you might get a fixed salary and a stable income. But much more common, particularly for experienced salespeople, is that um, they work on a commission or bonus, which means that there's a performance incentive in the more sales you make, the more income you receive. Um, and this can be done on a quarterly or on an annual basis. Um, but basically, it's rewarding people for um, being more productive and making more sales. Now, there's places where this is a bad idea. And I think you saw this um, particularly during the housing crisis in the early 2000s where people were paid bonuses based on how many mortgages they were able to complete, i.e. that they were selling mortgages, and therefore they were making mortgages to low quality customers, ones who would probably not be able to handle or manage that mortgage. Um, and as a result, um, incentivizing people to make more sales or close more deals led to more problems as many of those mortgages uh, turned out to be bad mortgages. Um, Sometimes uh, they get compensated for expenses, particularly if they're traveling. So they get comp to their meals or uh, hotel uh, accommodations or uh, rental cars or things of that sort that are related to their job. And lastly, they might get, depending on a certain level of activity, some type of fringe benefits, um, which is more. Um, so supervising it is one of the, 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 the tough things because you, the salespeople are going to be working independently. Um, they're going to be mostly themselves and the client and not necessarily with their supervisors looking over their shoulder. Um, and therefore, you need people who are independent and motivated 
and are willing to work smart and not be as dependent upon other people in the company to accomplish their things. So um, you might see a lot, for example, where they might uh, work on identifying the customers and setting call, uh, you help them identify the customers, which means you might provide what are called leads. So for example, people who have uh, expressed interest like an online survey or filled out a card um, at some type of event and therefore you will send to them and then your salesperson is following up to see if they're still interested in making a purchase. Uh, they might set like standards about the call norms or those binders of let's say scripts that um, salespeople work with. Um, they might um, create an organization of like how you spend the time during the week, which means you might have them fill out time charts about how they're spending their time or doing a certain number of calls a week or a certain number of calls a day. You might set calls are done on a certain day and prospecting on, on a different day of the week. So you might do some type of give them some type of structure to work in. Um, and uh, you might provide some technology that gives them, let's say, a common presentation or a video. So once again, using the example of solar panel sales, um, they had you know, a company issued laptop that had a standard presentation and a calculator about costs and all the different types of things that they might need uh, to go door to door and to make sales. Um, so what is the thing is that a lot of people don't actually spend a lot of time actively selling, meaning face to face in front of clients. So this is just one study looking at how salespeople spend their time and only about 10% of their time is spent actively selling. As you can see, a lot of it is just, is particularly on the road, is you're traveling from place to place or client to client. A lot of this is administration, which means record keeping, and that could be record keeping in terms of um, calculating expenses, uh, receipts, uh, uh, filling out paperwork and contracts for sales and things of that sort. And a lot of it is just, you know, um, you might, I know it's called an empty time, but time where you're thinking, you're prospecting, you're looking planning for your, uh, your, your strategy. Um, and that can take up a lot or if not all the time. And because they're working on an incentive system, they're mostly going to work, you know, based upon what their convenience or their own uh, time schedule is. So what you're seeing increasingly because the internet never sleeps is that, you know, people are selling over the internet and they're using it as a, as a basis. So you're having different ways to contact. People can fill out forms. People can, send in emails, make phone calls. Um, and what they're able to do is have sales meeting kind of asynchronously that you could have people who are in a different country or in a different time zone uh, call people at a, you know when they have the most energy and you know, maybe more people are more relaxed. So um, late in the evening, around dinner time, things of that sort. Um, the internet also saves a lot of money in terms of travel because obviously you don't have to, um, if you're living at home, you don't need to summon to expense a rent a car or uh, comp compensate them for, for meals or compensate them for um, you know, lodging and things of that sort. So you're seeing things like Sales 2.0, which is one type of platform as a technology that can um, you know, help uh, you know, be the pl a virtual platform for connecting with uh, clients. So because it's not clear what constitutes work. For example, that as a salesperson, you could be working very hard and not closing any sales or making a lot of sales and not working very hard. So it means depending on your client, you could make a lot of sales all at once and then work very hard for several months and make very few sales. Um, so you need some ways to, in a sense, incentivize and organize and structure. Um, and it, frankly, because salespeople have to be kind of in a positive state of mind most of the time, to keep their spirits up and the morale, particularly when they're working in tough situations. So an organizational climate that is supportive, um, some people are more hard sellers. So there's kind of like always be selling and kind of someone yelling in your ear, kind of like a cracking whip um, metaphorically. Um, you can set sales quotas, which means you have to sell a certain amount of, uh, per month. Um, you can give them incentive to sell more. Um, uh, because many of these are a personality, competitive people, sales contests among your sales associates uh, sometimes uh, can be a big thing. Um, someone that I know that worked for Pepsi Bottling Group um, would always look every single week to see how he did vis-a-vis -vis his uh, co-workers and how they did in their territories and would basically 
kind of was, was proud about trying to be the top seller in his region every single week. Um, and I think that competition is something that drives a lot of people who go to this field. So another part is just evaluating salespeople, uh, salesperson's productivity. Um, and, you know, obviously the easiest way to look at this is terms of sales completed or sales closed, because obviously there's something quantitative that can be measured there. Um, but you might make it in terms of how many calls they make, um, how long their conversations are, particularly if they're working on a telephone, um, how many contacts they make. Um, and I think that because, uh, because salespersons are working very independently at times, um, to provide a structure and clear standards for like how they're being judged is a good way of, let's say, giving them feedback and kind of con incentivizing and shaping their behavior in a way to motivate them to be more productive than they would be otherwise. 